Hello, everyone. I'm Krishan Veer. I am developer evangelist with Cisco DevNet. I focus on security technologies. And I have with me Jared Smith from Security BU. And today, we're going to actually do some exciting uh, uh, demo. And we're going to actually navigate the, uh, the FTD API Explorer. And uh, um, this Explorer actually is bundled on the box on, for our Firepower uh, Threat Defense API. It's a great tool. And I'm looking forward to learn about it because it just got released in 6.2.3. So Jared, Thank show you very much what, for your... what so, the Explorer can do. Excellent, excellent. So again, my, my name is Jared Smith. I'm the architect for Firepower Device Manager and the Firepower Threat Defense API. And FTD, or Firepower Threat Defense, is also known as NGFW. So just keep, keep that in mind. So one of the things, first I'll flip over here to the, the browser here. And before logging in, I just want to point out a couple of key things to keep in mind. One, one of the first things you'll notice here is it says not secure. What that means is it's a self-signed certificate that's being used here. And right now, there isn't a way to change that. So you're going to see that. You can accept that certificate in your browser to get rid of the warning. But it, you're like, you, you will see that the first time you bring it up. The other thing to keep in mind, because this is kind of a test setup here. I mean, I have my host name. That would, of course, be your either the IP address of your management interface. Or if you access through your inside data port, it can also be the IP of your inside data port. And then the port here. I'm using a non-standard port because I have a lab set up here. So the default port that it'll always be on is 443. So the standard thing you would just do is HTTPS colon slash slash the IP of the interface that you're connecting on either the management or the inside data port. And then you wouldn't need the port as long as you don't NAT it through anything in a lab setup. So just keep that in mind, default port 443. So then let me clear that. And then I'm going to log in really quickly here. The default username, of course, is, is admin. So you'll log in with admin. And then if, if you haven't set up your box previous to doing this exercise, the default credential is admin123 with a capital A, and the rest being lowercase. So I'll take that. Now that I have my credential there, I will log into the box. And then what you see here is the default dashboard that you get when you log into the device that has all the controls there. I won't delve into those in this video. Because the key thing we want to do is get you into the API Explorer. And I will navigate that here with the keyboard really quick. And to get there, you just switch the URL to API-Explorer. And then it will launch into the API Explorer here. So this, just to, to recap some, some inf interesting information here, this uses Open API spec, which is the schema that our API is, is created in. Which, which is really just a, sch a schema of all of the REST APIs that we provide. And then we use the Swagger UI on top of that to generate the API browser. So this is an open source standard API browser on top of our API schema, which provides lots of value in that there's SDKs that can consume the open API spec. So just keep that in mind as you're going to program against that in the future. At the top here, you'll notice that there, there's some kind of high level text talking about the API and how it's used. One, one key thing to keep in mind right here, there is a caveat that we, we are not yet backwards compatible because th this API just came out in the 6.2.3 release. So one thing to keep in mind is the next revision may have slightly modified APIs. We're trying to keep them as consistent as possible, but there's a lot of change now as we're adding in features quickly. We will uh, stabilize that shortly and, and be backwards compatible at that point, but we're not there yet. So just keep that in mind. As we scroll across here, you'll notice this column here. I mean, the, these are all of the kind of categories of REST APIs that you can see. You notice if I click on one of those, let me clear out that. So, Jared, one yeah. thing I've noticed that when you went to API Explorer, um, you don't have to log in back again or authenticate yourself. So does it already, because you used the UI first, it just used your credentials to log in? or? It's a good, good, good question. So when, when you log into the API, it, it does OAuth authentication on the, the, the user interface there. It also re, it reuses the same bearer token that was set up during the UI authentication when you originally logged in. So yes, it'll, it'll reuse it, and you do not have to re-log in. So okay. 
pretty pretty convenient that way. The, the one thing is that we hadn't we didn't put the link in the UI yet, and I suspect that we will in the future add the link to the API Explorer. So that's something that for now you have to manually type it in the the URL there. Uh, but probably something that we'll address in the future by adding a kind of easy, easy quick link there. So what, one thing to notice here, you'll see on the screen that you have the HTTP methods down the left side. And to go through, the, the, these map to standard, you think of CRUD, CRUD operations. So we have post right, right here, which maps to a, a creation of an object. So that, that lets you make, if I wanted to make in this case, you can't make a new access policy because there's only one. But if it was a network object or a port object or something like that, you could create one of those objects. There's also get, which is to fetch and retrieve an instance or list of instances of an object. You have delete, which of course is to remove an instance of an object. And depending on the object, if it's a system created object, we would block deletion of the object. So just keep that in mind. You'll get an error if you do something that's not allowed. And then put the, the last type of HTTP method here is for an update of an object. So if you want to change a name, change a description, change a value, put, if it's already in the system, so if it's previously been posted, you would do a put to update that object. So, so if the object doesn't exist and I use the put, uh, what is the behavior? It, you should get an error if you do a put. Because yeah, po post is the correct way to create a new instance of an object. And it, some of the other just standard things that you'll see about how URLs are structured. In the case of policy, you'll notice that there is a, a like a parent ID that's in the middle, and then you have the the end object here. And if you look here, you'll see that there's an ID at the end. So if you wanted like an access policy instance, and there's only one of them, you would get the access policies. You do, you would do this API right 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 here to get the access policies. And then you would fetch the ID, and you could stick it in this API to then get all access rules under an access policy. So you, you get the hang of it after a while. But basically, when you see the things in the curly braces here, those are placeholders for where you'll need to insert an ID value. So keep, keep that in mind if you're browsing this. And let me jump down to a slightly sim simpler object, and we will walk through using it a bit. So I'm going to go down to port object. And here is port object. And it's a port object like a TCP port, a UDP port, very simple object. So we'll walk through how to use this. So a couple of things to note in here as, as I get inside. So you, of course, you see the HTTP method again. And then you see the URL here. So it's slash object slash TCP ports. So that's a standard pattern for all of our policy objects fall into the object bucket there. And then you'll see the, the, the port type. And then here, what you, you see, there's kind of two key things here. You have example value and you have model. And example value will show you a sample kind of JSON schema of what needs to be passed. It has placeholder values, so it'll basically just show the data type and a string. So just keep, keep that in mind. If, if you were to post this um, to do a creation, you would swap the string for the actual value. And I'll show you what a post looks like. It, give, it again gives you a template that you can play with. And then a couple of things just from a standard standpoint, the version field right, right here is, is pretty much a random string that's used to avoid update collisions. So when you fetch an object, you'll see something that looks like a random string. It basically is a random string. So if you do a put, the idea is that you pass the version back to the server. And then if someone had already updated that object before you, then, then your version would no longer be valid. So you have to have a matching version to the current instance that's saved in the database when you do an update. So keep that in mind. Always pass back version input. So Jared, what you are suggesting is that if you're doing a put operation, you should be doing get operation first on the object. Get, yes. And then you get that magic cookie which you talked about yeah, just yeah, now, yeah. the string, and then pass it back in the put. Otherwise, you will get errors. Exactly. exactly. Okay. I, that, that's definitely the pattern I would recommend is do a get, modify the field. So if you, let's say you want to change the name. Do a get, tweak the name, or tweak the description, or tweak the value, yes. and then do a, do a put operation to save that back. That, that is definitely the right, right design pattern to use here. And then, mo OK, all, all the objects will pretty much have a name. Description's pretty standard. Is system defined just tells you, is an object that's, that kind of comes canned with the system. So in the case of 
TCP port objects, there are many objects that we have kind of inbuilt with the system mm -hmm. that come there. So you, you could expect to find many of those. So it's an easy one to play around with here. Other key things that you'll see on pretty much every object is an ID. An ID is the system identifier for an instance of this object. So if I had a port that was maybe like my SSH port, which would be port 22 TCP, then that, that would have its own ID instance to identify itself. So if you want to be able to retrieve it, and it, like if you look down here, you'll notice that if you want to get an instance of a port, there's the version with the object ID at the end. And that, that version is for fetching a single instance versus the top one is for fetching a list of instances. So just recognize that pattern that if you don't see a slash with a thing with the curly braces at the end, this is the get the list of these object types. So then you'll also always see the type of the object and then the links at the end. So links, you will get a URL back to the instance that you fetched. And I'll, 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 I'll execute this and we, we can see what it looks like live. So this is just sample text. The other thing to think about here is there is the ability here, if you click model instead of example value, you get descriptive text. So I'd say this is much more the documentation version of the, the schema. If you want to see what is this field used for, you can go here. And you'll also see useful data like uh, you can see ranges, you can see cannot be null. So there's, there's basically the constraints or things like enum values, you can see what they are, and here's some port stuff going on. So you get all the details on what's allowed. Even in cases like this, you'll see a regex that, that's allowed there. So keep, keep that in mind. Go look here if you're modifying an object to see what's really allowed. So th this, I, I would say, is, is the best documentation. You'll also see at the bottom here constructs like paging. If you want to see the, the stuff that you will get when I pull a list back, there will be constructs for retrieving a page of objects. And I'll show you this we do the actual the actual get, because it'll, it'll be a little more intuitive there. So uh, Jared, can you double click a little bit on the concept of paging? Yeah. Uh, so quickly for... Good, good, good question. So the, the problem is, let, let's say I have a thousand objects or a couple hundred objects. It may not be practical to fetch them in a single list. So the idea is that you can, so we have limit, so you can control the size of that list. So let limits there. So if you only want 10 objects at a time, you can just say, hey, limit 10. And there's also offset, which is where I start pulling things from the list. So you could say offset 0, limit 10, get. And you'll get the first 10 objects. And then you can keep kind of incrementing your offset to move to, to, re, to pull the next set of 10. So you keep moving that, and it's like the sliding window that you go across that page set. So that, that definitely is, is the, basically a construct for scaling this, because it's not always practical to pull the entire list. So that, 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 that's how we solve that. I think it's a pretty standard pattern in uh, REST to do things like that. So the next thing to notice down here is you, you actually can manipulate the paging construct in the API Explorer here. And there's this handy button here for try it out. So I'm going to click that. And what this does under the covers is it uses the fact that I already have a logged in token. So that's the one thing that we don't show the complexity of the token because you're already logged in. However, you can see what, what was done in the API. So you can see some curl syntax for if I did this with curl, with, with the note being that it does not include the token. And we'll have, we'll have other videos that get into details on how to log in with a token. So you can figure out how to script that yourself. And it's, it's pretty simple. You've got good boilerplate code for that. There's also the request URL here, which shows the full URL, because one thing to note is the URL at the top here, go back there, is just object TCP ports. If you notice down here, you see the full URL. So you see API, FDM, V1, object TCP ports. So you see the fully expanded version of the URL. If you're actually doing a get call, you want the full version of that URL there. So just keep, keep that in mind. Always, it's, what I find to be a good pattern is try the API Explorer, do the API call there, and then use what you learn here to go write your code against that. So API. Jared, can you uh, use uh, your highlighter and highlight that URL, the actual URL for TCP port in this? Yeah, it's okay. right, right here is the full URL. So okay. yeah, I, I definitely look, look at that when you're programming against the API, because it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to learn exactly what needs to be done there. Then if we look down at the response body, you'll see there's a couple of constructs. They're standard. One is 
it, if you do the version without an ID at the end, where you're getting a list of objects, we have, to, we have to model that list and return the list. So you'll see here we have items. So items, you'll notice is an array, and this is JSON structure here. And that array then has, you'll see curly braces kind of before and after each dictionary here. So th there's basically a dictionary with, with the variables or the, or the kind of key value pairs within each object instance. In this case, you'll see the names AOL, Here's the port number is 5190. You see the unique ID allocated to that instance here. You see the type. And don't forget the type when you're programming against this, because if you leave out the type, you'll get an error. So you need, you need to pass the type back. And that's where it's good to just run a sample pass here. You can see exactly what it looks like in the sample schema. And that'll help you get things right when you're programming against it. And then links here, you'll notice you get the full URL. And in this case, you'll see API FDM v1 objects TCP ports, but then you'll see the ID at the end. And this ID is the same as the ID right here. So th this pulls that, if you want a unique URL for that instance, here it is. It's returned with that object. And then if we skip to the end of this document, you'll see the paging kind of construct. And you'll see that it pulled limit 10, offset 0. There's a total of 182. So the default page size in this case was 10 for this object type. You can make it bigger. If you want to get the whole 182, you can either make it 182 or you can make it 200. It will pull all the records back. And then a couple of things to notice at the end is you can see response code. In this case, you can see the response code of 200. That re represents that it was a, a successful GET request. So you can use that to figure things out. And then you can see the response headers here. And the one, one thing it doesn't show you in the API Explorer is the re request headers. And we'll get into that in some of the other videos, seeing what's required to be able to make one of these API calls. It's, it's pretty simple. But just keep, it, keep in mind that you have to set the bearer token for the OAuth authentication in the request header. So one question I have. So you, in the first version, we are supporting just JSON, or are we supporting any other content type in payload? So right, right now, the serialization is always JSON, right? Okay. Yeah, definitely good to keep that in mind. The good, the good thing about JSON is pretty much every programming language, be it Java, Python, I'm sure Perl, and other languages have easy libraries where you can just take take the JSON document, read it into it, typically into a dictionary, and just quick key value fetching of, of, of objects. So it's it's one of the simplest structures to parse. In my experience, much much simpler than doing XML parsing, and it's just less verbose. So that I mean, that's why we like it. It's just kind of natural as a for a programmer to go consume JSON documents. So that is what, that's basically what a get would look like. I'll show you a couple other quick, quick things here. So in a post, some minor differences. At the top, that looks the same. And actually, you can see the response content type is application JSON. So that's one request header. And the, content, the parameter content type is also application JSON. And one of the things you can do if you click over the example value here for the request, it will populate this little window here with, with a kind of sample template for what you would need to do to create this object. A couple of things to keep in mind there that version, you don't need to pass when you create. And un unfortunately, the way it works now, it, it populates all of the fields. So one thing to keep in mind if you are doing a post through the API Explorer is that you'll need to clean out some of these fields that don't apply in the create case. One of those is version. And I believe description is, is typically optional. So you could leave that off if you want. You would need to specify a name, which would just be a unique name that doesn't conflict with other instances of this object. So you'd need to populate that field. You could get rid of description. You can get rid of is system defined. It will default to false for a user created object. And then port, you would need, in this case, port is a mandatory field for a TCP port object. So you would need to populate that with a valid TCP port. And in the case of create, you don't pass the ID. The system allocates the ID value. So keep that in mind. So you would delete that. You would delete version. But you would leave type, because type you always pass on all, all, all of the create or put and post requests. So leave those there. And then you can go through here, and similar to the other one, you can do a try it now to do a post operation in the API Explorer. So if you're having problems with your script trying to do things, highly recommend going to the API Explorer and, uh, and try using that to go create 
your object to see if it works. Because if, you're, if, if you run into a bug, this is an easy way to do it, get feedback, look at the documentation, see the sample JSON, and kind of walk through that whole exercise. And then delete is, is much simpler, because really you just have to pass the object ID with, with the delete, and that, that quickly uh, will, will resolve doing a delete there. And that's about, about it for walking through the API browser. So I, just to kind of re recap some of the stuff we went through, it's a great way to doc, kind of look at the documentation for the API because we have field by field documentation. It also is, is a great way to try the API. I mean, I, I use this frequently to figure out if, if there's a problem, you can get down and tweak fields that sometimes are harder to tweak through the UI. So if you're doing, I mean, at least for us internally for development, if you're doing testing against it, you want to say, hey, what if I tweak this and d does, it, does it behave correctly? It's a, it's a very easy way to see if it does the right thing. And you can do all the operations. So it's, it's a great way to get started. And just keep in mind that you will, if you're writing the script, have to do the token to log in with OAuth. And we'll cover that in other videos. But through this, you don't have to worry about that. You log in the UI, you tweak the URL to API-Explore, and you're good to go. So, uh, Jared, I have a question. Uh, so this is not replacing UI. I mean, let's clarify that, right? This is an explorer where, where it's like a test bed. That's my understanding so far. And uh, one more thing I want to add or ask you yeah. is that, is this actually modifies the real system? So if it is a production yeah. system, you probably don't want to play with it. Is that correct? Yeah, so th this, this is, as, as you said, very much not a replacement for the full UI. It's more an addition to make, to document for an API programmer against it. So that, that was more the intention here, was to make it simple for people to consume and learn the API. And that was a very good question about, does it really make updates? Or, or is it just a kind of a play area? Yeah. This is making live updates. So if, if you go change a rule here, delete a rule, it will really delete that rule. So yeah, definitely if, if, you, if you're on a production system, be very careful. I mean, it's a great thing if you stage up a box in the lab and just want to tinker around, or if you have a VFT or a NGFWV kind of virtual instance of this. I mean, that's what I use to kind of play as a, as, as a bit of a sandbox, actually. To tie, tie it to that, one of the good things with DevNet is we will have sandboxes that the user can go try to, try to do a virtual instance and play with these APIs and play with the API Explorer and also program against the API. So I, th I think y y learning labs and DevNet are, are a great place to, to exercise this without impacting your production device. Absolutely, and Jared, and, and thank you so much. Uh, this was really good. This tool uh, seems to be really powerful uh, to learn how to uh, program against uh, FTD API. So cool. thank you. Thank you very much.